Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Revolution 250 podcast. I'm Bob Allison. I chair the Rev 250 Advisory Group. I also teach history at Suffolk University. And our guest today is Alex Kane. Alex is the author of two books, We Stood Our Ground, Lexington in the First Year of the American Revolution, and I See Nothing But the Horrors of a Civil War, another book about the beginnings of the revolution. You also maintains a blog, which I recommend, Historical Nerdery, which has all kinds of great stuff about uh, the revolution, particularly focusing on Lexington and Concord. So, Alex, thanks for joining us. Thank you very much for having me. And so uh, we were just chatting before about how you got interested in, uh, A, the revolution, but then, B, looking at the, we're, we're going to be looking today at a different aspect of the battles of Lexington and Concord. That is, where were the civilians that day? Were people in their homes? What had happened when they heard that the British were on their way? And uh, what kind of recollections did they have afterward? And you've done a lot of work actually kind of combing this, finding about what people were saying afterward or at the time and afterward. It, it, it's become sort of a, a fascination of mine uh, over the last probably four or five years as to the, the civilian role of the battles of Lexington Concord on uh, April 19th, 1775. And how I got into it uh, was just by chance. Uh, mm. I think it was around about April, 2017 or 2016. Okay. Uh, a, a member of the Lexington Minutemen named Michael DeRue um, approached me and said, hey, I'm looking at one of the affidavits uh, from the Battle of Lexington, and the militiamen is referencing that they were waiting in the abandoned houses around the green. And, and it dawned on me, I was hmm. like, oh my God, uh, you know, yeah. that's, that's a great point. What happened to the civilians? Yeah. And so as a result, I started taking a deep dive uh, mm -hmm. that just has built over the years uh, into uh, multiple accounts, uh, multiple stories of, of what happened to the civilians mm -hmm. uh, on April 19, 1775. Um, I've coined it uh, the civilian evacuation uh, mm -hmm. because that's what it was. It was a two-phased mass evacuation that began uh, around the midnight, April 18th, April 19th, 1775, and continued throughout yeah. the day yeah. where you saw people, civilians, uh, men, women, children, and enslaved mm -hmm. peoples, uh, displaced uh, from all the major mm -hmm. towns along the Battle Road. Uh, and, and it actually had a massive impact, not just on the communities along Battle Road, mm -hmm. but those other communities where these these refugees, as they were, right. uh, fled for safety. Hmm. Yeah, it's interesting. And you have a couple, like Joseph Esterbrook, he, carry, he helps carry his mother yes. and her his new newborn um, brother, I guess, out on a mattress. Yes, Joseph Esterbrook is an interesting character because there's an ongoing debate uh, amongst historians of Lexington and mm -hmm. Congress, did Joseph Esterbrook return to the Battle of Lexington? Mm -hmm. um, he, uh, he wrote an account in the 19th century around 1820, 1824, said, I was present, and you know, there mm -hmm. were musket balls that went through my coat as I fled the green. Mm -hmm. uh, there's others who said he, he is fibbing, but, that, mm -hmm. but that's a, a, a side, uh, side story. Joseph Esterbrook is an interesting uh, person because uh, what you had for Le focusing on Lexington, on April 18th, April 19th, 1775, you had at least seven women who mm -hmm. had either just recently given birth within the previous mm -hmm. weeks or were eight plus months pregnant wow. at the time of the Battle of Lexington. So there was a strong desire to get them to safety when mm -hmm. word started to spread through the town that there was a British expedition en route to Concord. Mm -hmm. uh, Joseph Esterbrook's story uh, is unique um, because, first of all, he is part of the Esterbrook family, which is the wealthiest family in Lexington mm -hmm. at the time. Uh, they were also the owners of, of the slave Prince Esterbrook right. who fought at the Battle of Lexington. Mm -hmm. Joseph Esterbrook's account, which is a 19th century account, but it is consistent with some of the period accounts I've seen. Uh, his mother was um, uh, had just given birth uh, approximately about 10 to 12 days previously, and mm -hmm. she was still uh, bedridden as a result of the delivery of um, mm -hmm. uh, Joseph's younger brother. Um, Joseph at the time was somewhere between about 14 to 16 years of age. The account is, is that he and his mother, uh, he and his father, excuse me, uh, placed uh, Mrs. Esterbrook uh, onto a family chair and proceeded to carry her uh, three miles uh, hmm. to a place. Wow. And, and that's what we see with Lexington uh, and it's yeah. other towns as well. But with Lexington, we saw the evacuation go approximately two to three miles away from the fight uh, mm -hmm. for most of them. Uh, some of them headed north, uh, excuse me, uh, northwest towards the Burlington Bedford mm -hmm. area. Mm -hmm. uh, they took refuge in a farm that was nicknamed Smock Farm. Uh, I'm still to this day trying to locate right. the so-called really? Smock 
Um, it, I have no idea where it was mm -hmm. other than it was in the direction of Bedford and Burlington, Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. The second route that I saw many of the families uh, take was heading towards Woburn. Mm -hmm. uh, the district that was part of Lexington um, along the Woburn border was nicknamed Scotland. Uh, mm -hmm. And the reason it was, it was a high percentage of Scot uh, Scottish immigrants uh, who during the 1740s settled in Lexington in that area. So many of the families were heading out um, to, uh, to the uh, area mm -hmm. called Scotland uh, mm -hmm. during this time. There are other accounts of families who were, who were moving inland uh, and, and so forth. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we have two accounts. Uh, we do have one account of Rebecca Fisk. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, who I recently discovered, yeah. uh, I take that back, Minuteman National Park recently discovered okay. and shared it with me. Yeah. Uh, and then there is the account of Anna Monroe. Right. Uh, Anna Monroe, uh, who was the wife of Sergeant William Monroe, uh, they chose to pretty much remain near the homestead. Uh, now, were they involved with the Monroe Tavern? Anna Monroe was involved in the Monroe Tavern. Uh, so her husband was the proprietor and owner uh, of mm -hmm. the tavern. She played a significant role uh, during the evacuation. Uh, the the mm -hmm. one thing that stuck in my mind, and she was the first person I discovered when I started looking mm -hmm. into uh, this phenomenon known as the civilian evacuation. Mm -hmm. um, she and her daughter, well, it was her daughter who wrote the account, and Anna sort of peppered it in, the mother. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I should clarify, there's two Annas. There's Anna the mother and Anna okay. the daughter. Okay. Uh, Anna, the daughter, wrote a primary account in the uh, early 19th century about what took place on April 19, 1775. Mm -hmm. And she describes how she remembers uh, her mother uh, crying, baking mm -hmm. bread uh, shortly after midnight of uh, April 19, 1775, fearing that she was never going to see her husband again because she was breaking, mm -hmm. baking bread for her husband. Uh. So she, she's facing this traumatic uh, event. You have multiple men, women, and children who are concerned about their wives and daughters mm -hmm. and mothers who need to be evacuated. Mm -hmm. uh, and at the same time, you have the militia who, who's preparing for war. Right. So she's uh, baking bread because he's going to be marching off with yes. uh, the militia. Yes. Um, keep in mind, the, the, the spiritual leader of Lexington at this time is the Reverend Jonas Clark. Now, mm -hmm. even his family is in a panic right. at this particular point. Mm -hmm. um, and what happened was, is Jonas Clark had been preaching for years, war is coming, mm -hmm. uh, we need to prepare for it. And it is mm -hmm. your duty, if you are a male citizen of Lexington, to go to war to protect your brothers, sisters, mm -hmm. wives, mm -hmm. mothers, and daughters. So now this reality is now knocking on their right. doors. So th this is the mindset of Lexington mm -hmm. on the battle. Yeah. It's in full panic mode at this mm -hmm. point. Mm -hmm. Okay. So Anna Monroe, though, she and her family leave, and then what happens? So Anna Monroe and her family, they ended up fleeing not very far, uh, directly behind Monroe Tavern, even to this day, is, is sort of a large hill. Uh, from what I understand, they fled over the crest of the hill and, and hid on the mm -hmm. other side of the hill while the expedition marched past, past her residence. Mm -hmm. Uh, there's other accounts, for example, Lydia Parker, uh, who is the wife of Captain John Parker, remained home uh, with her children. What worked to Lydia Parker's advantage is they were not along the Massachusetts Bay Road, so they mm -hmm. did not have direct contact with mm -hmm. the uh, British regulars. But what happened was, is uh, the Battle of Lexington takes place. Mm -hmm. And as far as I know, there are little to no civilians uh, at the battle. There are some dis uh, disagreements among historians whether there may have been spectators and there mm -hmm. were some spectators mm -hmm. um but i've seen some people suggest that there may have been hundreds of spectators there i do question that mm -hmm. particularly given that the lexington populace is, is pretty much evacuated right yeah um but keep in mind lexington and most of new england at this time is deforested so right. sound travels very well so yeah. i have at least three accounts uh lydia parker anna monroe and um rebecca fisk who actually said they heard the discharge of muskets uh, taking place at the Battle of Lexington. Mm -hmm. So they realized something is happening. Mm -hmm. um, Anna Monroe and her daughter and a younger son and an infant uh, remained uh, within the homestead. Uh, mm -hmm. They returned to the tavern uh, after the battle took place. Mm -hmm. Lydia Parker sent her, uh, her son, who was too young for militia service, to go down to the green to see what happened. He wow. apparently went to a nearby hill and looked down and was able to see the aftermath of the battle. How old was he, Alex? Um, he was about eight or nine at the time. 
Interesting. Um, so he, he was able to, to watch. Mm -hmm. um, then you finally have Rebecca uh, Fisk. Yes. Uh, Rebecca Fisk, whose residence is at the very entrance of, of the east side of Minuteman National Park. Um, she described that she heard the uh, discharge of musketry. Mm -hmm. Now, her, her husband, uh, now her maiden name was Howe, and she was originally from Concord. Okay. Her husband, who was a Fisk, um, was... Um, was too sick to serve in the militia that day. Mm -hmm. In fact, he was on what we would call long-term disability. And her father-in-law, she was also caring for, who was elderly and, and was dying. Uh, so what happened, she described, said, I couldn't flee the house because I couldn't get these two gentlemen out yeah. of the house. So she describes in her account, watching the British regulars marching past her house as they're going on to Concord mm -hmm. and how horrified she was, realizing that war uh, took place. Right. Yeah, yeah. Now, I'm, I'm, by the way, I'm still thinking about someone sending their eight-year-old son to go see, yeah. check out the battle. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It, it's, it, it's an interesting approach. Um, you know, I, I, I caught that because I see yeah. that a few times. I, I, yeah. I believe Abigail Adams may have sent one of her children yeah. to watch the Battle of Bunker Hill before right, she yeah. arrived. Yeah. Um, I've seen other accounts of, of dispatching uh, children. I, I think the rationale was that it, it was along the lines of... <laughs> Go go see what's going on, but don't get too close and come back and report the mom. Yeah, that, that's understandable. I yeah. think in that kind of thing. And, and also, there people also were hiding valuables. They were finding places. Yes, yeah. this was this was something uh, that uh, Mary Fuhrer, uh, who's a uh, historian yeah. uh, of Lexicon, first uh, identified yes. this phenomenon. The, there were multiple civilians, uh, predominantly women, who were hiding valuables because there was a belief, a justifiable belief, yeah. that the British Army, either en route to Concord on the way back to Concord, was going to go on a looting spree. Mm -hmm. Now, keep in mind, first of all, looting in 18th century New England under colonial laws was a capital offense. Mm. Uh, it was on par with murder and, and, mm. and rape and arson. Uh, mm. It was a crime mm. that if you were convicted of looting, you would be executed for. Right. Uh, so it's a highly offensive act. Mm -hmm. um, the the civilians were not without justification for believing that the British yeah. were going to loot. Uh, they, right. had, they had accounts uh, from Scotland. They had accounts from Ireland, mm -hmm. yeah. from India, that the British Army actually engaged in this. That oh, they, yeah. they would wipe the enemy from the field and then loot the dead and loot near right. the yeah. What was the interesting phenomenon here that Mary Fuhrer first identified, and I kind of took a deep dive in, is what the civilians were hiding. And it's more focusing on what the uh, women were doing. Mm -hmm. Under 18th century colonial laws, uh, women, for the most part, were um, considered civilly dead, uh, which means once they married their husband, whatever they owned, um, was considered the property of the husband, mm -hmm. with one uh, exception, and that was uh, household goods or household mm -hmm. movables. So anything along the lines of textiles, uh, uh, dealing with perhaps uh, dinner plates, uh, knives, forks, uh, perhaps some silver, or perhaps some uh, female clothing, was considered to be inheritable through the female line. Okay. So when I started looking at what the accounts were of what women were hiding, um, as well as what they later on would claim was stolen or, mm -hmm. or, or, or lost mm -hmm. as a result of the British destruction on the retreat back from Concord, you're seeing them hiding items that were uh, that were their own, that they were had legal rights to. Mm -hmm. uh, we see silverware hidden, we see plates hidden, we see mm -hmm. uh, 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 fabric being hidden. Mm -hmm. Uh, some accounts communion silver, uh, which was wow. really important. Yeah. So it was definitely a move, particularly Lydia Mulliken. Uh, she mm -hmm. was probably the hardest hit of the of the Lexington uh, mm -hmm. uh, destruction on the retreat back from Concord. Uh, she describes how she and her daughters were hiding uh, multiple valuables that would be considered inheritable along the female line. Mm -hmm. Now, there were other things that were hidden. Uh, the Clark family. Uh, was hiding uh, both uh, monetary items of value as well as, as items that could be inherited along the female line. Um, there are accounts of, of male personal belongings being hidden as well. And, and it's your classic hide the best you can. Uh, right. yeah. family did hide some stuff up in their attic, mm -hmm. but the trend mm -hmm. that I see is that the civilian evacuees would grab as much as they could carry and then basically... Um, go out into the woods, go into nearby uh, tree stumps, underneath mm. 
rock walls in the swamp and just bury anything wow. and everything they could. Interesting. Yeah. We're, yeah, we're, we're talking with Alex Kane, who keeps the historical nerdery um, blog, as well as the author of a couple of books on We Stood Our Ground on Lexington in the First Year of the Revolution, and I See Nothing But the Horrors of the Civil War. About the, we're talking about the civilian evacuation of Lexington and Concord on the day of the battles. And you mentioned uh, the Reverend Jonas Clark, and then his daughter, I think, Elizabeth, has a reminiscence about going back to the meeting house later. Yes, this, this, is, this is a really fun area because this is my subset uh, of mm -hmm. the civilian evacuation where I'm trying to collect child witness accounts uh, mm -hmm. of uh, April 19th, uh, 1775. To date, I'm only aware of two. Oh, wow. Uh, that, that being Anna Monroe, the daughter of William and Anna Monroe, mm -hmm. uh, and then Elizabeth Clark. There, there is another account. I apologize. I'm, draw, I'm drawing a blank on her name. She gave a description of the Battle of Bunker Hill. So that, okay. that's a right. second one. Yeah. Uh, she was the daughter of a, of a loyalist family. So Anna and Elizabeth are the only two. And, and so the Clark family, there is some discrepancy whether uh, Reverend Jonas Clark was present at the Battle of Lexington. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, he definitely was present earlier in the night or earlier in the morning, excuse mm -hmm. me, uh, where there was a debate amongst the Lexington militia. Do they remain on the green or do they start marching towards mm -hmm. Concord or another rallying point? Um, but the family did evacuate. Uh, mm -hmm. the, the Clark homestead is less than a quarter of a mile from the green. It, it yep. was visible from the green at the time. Mm -hmm. Um, after the battle was over, uh, again, as we're talking about sending the kids, you know, everywhere, yeah. uh, uh, the Reverend Clark and his wife sent Elizabeth Clark, who was about 12 years old at the time of the battle, uh, down to the green to see what happened. Wow. Um, and she describes basically the aftermath uh, of the uh, of the events. Now, many of the civilians of Lexington had returned back after the battle. Mm -hmm. And so they are absolutely horrified to see what they found. There was uh, at least eight dead on the green. Mm -hmm. Seven of them are, are from Lexington. The eighth is mm -hmm. from Hoover. Yeah. Uh, and basically it's just death and destruction. Mm -hmm. She describes about how basically they, they quickly buried, had a quick memorial service for the eight that were killed. Uh, and then move them to the old burial ground where they put them in a shallow mass grave. Mm. Uh, and then the Reverend Clark uh, ordered that the uh, the eight dead uh, be covered with brush. Mm. Uh, there is an absolute fear uh, that the British, when they return, are going to defile the dead. Mm -hmm. And so as a result, um, the description is, is that the service was held in the meeting house, uh, which, mm -hmm. as you know, 18th century meeting houses are the same as the church. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so there's a service inside the meeting house. They are uh, boarded up in quickly made pine boxes, yeah. which are the coffins. Mm -hmm. And then they are brought uh, to the old burial ground, um, which is off of uh, Massachusetts Ave today, and buried in a shallow grave and then covered mm -hmm. up with, with this brush mm -hmm. to, to make it look like a brush pile mm -hmm. so that when the British came back, they wouldn't be drawn to this particular grave site. Well, no, are they still there? Mm -hmm. uh, was, was who then? The, the, the dead, are they still there? Oh, thank you. <laughs> the, uh, the dead did remain there till uh, the 19th century, okay. uh, about, I believe, 1835. Mm -hmm. Seven out of the eight. Um, the, the eighth, the Woburn resident, was brought back to Woburn and eventually mm -hmm. buried in Woburn. But the seven men um, were then brought in 1835 to um, Lexington Common, okay. uh, where they are buried uh, right. on the knee. What's interesting is that I was actually talking with an uh, Army veteran about this over the weekend, mm -hmm. and she was prepared to give a Memorial Day speech about the, the obelisk. Mm -hmm. The obelisk underneath which they are buried uh, is the oldest war memorial uh, in the United States wow. in, uh, in the 1790s. Um, however, the men were not interred there uh, until the uh, early middle of the uh, of the 19th century. Interesting. Um, and so the seven men um, are currently buried there. Mm -hmm. Um, you do actually do see that a little bit in the 19th century where mm -hmm. uh, victims or, or uh, soldiers who were killed uh, during the uh, during the battle, um, they are actually um, uh, reinterred at, at different locations throughout the 19th century as part of a memorial service right. for the contributions of the day. That's interesting. We're, we're talking with Alex Kane about the civilian evacuation of Lexington and Concord in April of 1775. Now, there's also a fear, and, and uh, justifiable since it happens, of houses being burned by the British on their either on their arrival or on their retreat, and people are watching this as it's happening. Yes, this this is actually very very neat because there's there's first of all that I, I see neat because it, it really wasn't highlighted 
until you start seeing in about the, maybe the 20th century historians. It was sort of glossed mm. over a bit during the 19th century. Um, the, the, the first thing that stood in my mind is, is there, there is an account from a, a Needham minister um, who uh, pretty much indicates that as his militia company, because he, he accompanied them as their, their spiritual leader, they could actually adjust their course to try and intercept the British army mm -hmm. uh, based upon uh, the burning of the houses uh, that they could see off in the distance. They just simply started following the smoke plumes Interesting. and adjust their courses as the British column was coming through East mm -hmm. Lexington and um, you know, into Monotomy, which is mm -hmm. Cambridge at the time. Now. Right. Arlington. Arlington, yeah. Yes, the, the burning really didn't start until the afternoon. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, there is, there is, you know, the famous account that, that triggered the Battle of Concord, uh, where they were right. the army was burning carriages yeah, yeah. and their home caught accidentally on fire. But the true intentional burning didn't start until the British column uh, resumed its retreat in the afternoon of, of April 19th, mm -hmm. where Lord Hugh Earl Percy, because he recognized from East Lexington all the way through Cambridge, the roads are continually narrowing. Right, and houses are moving closer and closer to the to the road. Mm -hmm. It is an absolute sniper's nest. All uh, right, it, it's a very dangerous situation. So the mm -hmm. plan of attack that Percy decided was they would clear the houses first. Um, once the houses were cleared, uh, they would then be given orders to uh, burn the properties mm -hmm. uh, and then move on to the next one. Mm -hmm. So this uh, is to clear their evacuation route, yes. their retreat route to Charlestown. It, this is basically to create a pathway of retreat. Right. And so it has a twofold effect. From the civilian point of view, now the British are, are engaged in capital crime, arson yeah. and right. looting. Uh, from a military perspective, it's it's creating, to, to be blunt, and I, I've spoken to Jim Hollister and Joel Bowie about this, this is almost a, a 18th century version of a Black Hawk Down scenario, yeah. where the fighting is house to house, door right. to door, room to room, uh, and it is just bloody and brutal. Yeah. And they're just trying to ensure by burning the houses that the uh, American columns and the American forces can't re-enter the houses and fire at, at the back right. of the column. Mm -hmm. So it started in Lexington, and, and you start seeing accounts, uh, the Mulligan House and Anna Monroe, the tavern keeper, mm -hmm. um, where they pretty much are piling furniture uh, in the homes, and they're trying to set them on fire. Mm -hmm. um, the, the irony uh, was Anna Monroe with her baked bread uh, never got a chance to give her husband the bread, uh, and she would later, uh, her daughter would later account and say, the British forces ate it before they, mm -hmm. before they, they, they left the tavern and then tried to torch the tavern by mm -hmm. putting all of her mahogany furniture, which was high-end furniture for the yeah. time, in the center of the room and torching it. Uh, mm -hmm. Same happened uh, at Lydia Mulligan's house and several other homes. Right. Uh, the damage to Lexington property uh, for the burning alone uh, was roughly about 4,200 pounds, uh, which gets into six figures in today's currency. Yeah. Again, you have to take into account, not taking into, excuse me, not taking into account inflation. It's a lot of money. It is a lot of money, yeah. Um, that continued into Arlington. Mm -hmm. uh, there are two civilian accounts. Uh, there's Hannah Bradish and Hannah Adams, both of whom were bedridden, mm -hmm. um, where they both, you know, Hannah, poor Hannah Adams, um, when... They got word that the British column was entering monotony. Pretty much her husband abandoned her and, hmm. and fled uh, the property and either hid in a nearby barn or hid, you know, wow. was leaving her behind, wow. uh, which I which I found. I, I, I think the rationale was more along the lines of he thought that, well, if they only encountered a female in the house, she'll be safe from harm. Now, why was she bedridden? Was she? She had just delivered a child. Okay. okay. So she, her child was delivered hmm. roughly about a week earlier. Mm -hmm. where Hannah Bradish, who lived a few doors down, mm -hmm. uh, was roughly about two weeks earlier she had delivered mm -hmm. a child. Oh, wow. So when the British reached their, uh, Hannah Adams' house, they burst in and at the bayonet point uh, told her, you are to evacuate the house or mm -hmm. because we're going to burn the house to the ground or yeah, we'll really well. kill you where you stand. Mm -hmm. She was forced basically to go through broken windows and crawl wow. to, a, to a nearby shed Mm. Uh, as the British torched her house. Now, where was her baby? With her. Uh, oh, wow. with her. And, and so it was a wonderful propaganda piece for Massachusetts. Oh, yeah. Yeah, this woman crawling with her baby. Yep. It, it was, she, yeah. she, filled, uh, oh. she filled out an affidavit, and mm -hmm. it, when it hit England, it was a PR nightmare for, mm -hmm. for everyone. Mm -hmm. uh, related to that was Hannah Bradish. Now, mm -hmm. Hannah Bradish um, was a little bit older than Hannah Adams, 
Uh, she had just delivered a child, and she had two to three other children who were of toddler age. They were all under, mm -hmm. I believe, about eight years of age. Mm -hmm. The British, again, came in, and they told her um, uh, to evacuate. She refused. Mm -hmm. um, and surprisingly, the British didn't force her out, but she took refuge in her kitchen um, as the mm -hmm. fighting raged all around her house. And she describes, wow. um, despite the fact that the British threatened to torch the house, she was not going to leave. She mm -hmm. described bullets flying and hitting a chair directly behind that she was hiding behind. Oh. And she's sheltering her children okay. uh, in this oh. kitchen. Um, and that was an account that, again, that we recently had uh, uncovered. Mm -hmm. uh, and she also submitted an account to the Massachusetts Provincial Congress in the weeks, excuse me, in the months after mm -hmm. uh, Lexington and Concord. And again, that was passed on and used as a propaganda piece. But you do have uh, this this constant, you know, war zone that that, mm. that we're unfortunately. I, I have seven separate accounts of eight individuals who came in direct contact one way or the other with the British mm. government and the Massachusetts mm. forces as they are fighting each other mm. throughout the day. Mm. Well, we're we're talking with Alex Kane about the uh, civilian evacuation of. Lexington and Concord, but also then about this fight along the road in Monotomy as the British are retreating and they're clearing out the space on either side. You also have the story of Ishmael in Monotomy. And yes, this this is one I, I, I often say shame on me because I would get questions from time to time. What about what happened to enslaved people mm -hmm. uh, during uh, during April 19th and uh, 18th when the, the evacuation took place? Did they flee with uh, with their owners? Uh, did they attempt to join British forces? Mm -hmm. um, what happened? Well, we basically uh, with the first thing that tragically happened is I am aware of two accounts, one in Monotomy uh, and one in Framingham where as soon as the uh, Massachusetts Minute and militiamen from those two towns went off to engage the British forces, rumors started to spread uh, of a slave uprising. Mm -hmm. And so what happened was there was a, a count of uh, monotony women who were hidden maybe about a half mile, mile away from the fighting um, of, a, um, of a very prominent monotony family. And in comes a slave named Ishmael. And mm -hmm. the families that were hidden inside at this point were at an absolute peak of fright, believing mm -hmm. that it was a slave insurrection that was about to take place and that they were going to finish what the British Army had started. Mm -hmm. Ishmael comes in and the uh, owner of Ishmael basically said, are you here to kill us? Uh, and it turns out he, he wasn't. He was there to uh, make sure the family was safe. Well, wow. there's a subsequent account uh, that takes place, and I do believe this is Ishmael because it does line up with one of the um, property owners. There's an account of, a, of, a, of an enslaved person who literally is running across the firefight um, to put out a fire uh, in a monotony tavern hmm. uh, to protect the property. And, and it does line up. Uh, I believe it was the, it wasn't the Pollard Tavern. I think it might have been the, it wasn't the Brook Tavern. I'm drawing a blank. I apologize. Mm -hmm. But it was one of the taverns, he, he, the account. There's a similar account that took place in Framingham as well, um, where um, basically after the Framingham militia and minute companies left the town, the women uh, in town armed themselves with various farm equipment, believing that there was a slave insurrection was about to take wow. place, which never took place. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, but what we do have is we do have accounts such as Ishmael, who was checking mm. on the family, looking to protect the family, protect family property. And Rebecca Fr uh, Fisk does reference in her account. Now, Rebecca F Fisk is one of these few people like Anna Monroe who waited until almost the last yeah. minute to get out of the way with the British. And she mm -hmm. described how she and other civilians are fleeing across a farm field as the Americans are swinging through uh, to hit the British column uh, in uh, in Lincoln and mm. Lexington. And she describes among the people that are fleeing with her are enslaved people. Um, mm. There's definitely um, a presence of an enslaved people. Uh, enslaved civilians definitely contributed to ensuring that their masters were safe, the property mm. was safe, and they too uh, tried to get out of the way and, and, and protect you know, families from harm. Mm. Fascinating. We're, we're talking with Alex Kane about his work on uncovering what was happening on the day of the battles of Lexington and Concord and a lot of the interesting things, things happening in Monotomy, which is 
often overlooked in our accounts, as yep. are the civilians often overlooked, when that's really where most of the big fighting happened. Now, you have a, another character you mentioned named John Raymond, who was apparently a uh, cripple. Now, again, people have been pouring over who was there and who wasn't there, and apparently he's someone. Can you tell us his story? Yes, this this is an interesting because there, there was there is a presumption out there like if you were a male between sixteen and sixty, you were um, um, you were fighting on April nineteenth, and and I actually did find that there was a, a percentage of men who did not fight that day. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, some of them were ministers. I mean, ministers were responsible for tending to the flock, mm -hmm. and, and they mm -hmm. stayed with the, the the female and child population right. during evacuation. There were some who had, you know, there's an account of one Lexington uh, resident who was rather upset with his younger brother. Um, he had been out earlier in the day um, where he was serving as a scout, a mounted scout, returned mm -hmm. to gather his arms and equipment and found that his brother had taken off with it to go join Captain wow. Parker's company. So he was sort of left standing on a hill watching the fighting wow. taking place, wanting to kill his younger brother. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, you have others who were engaged in guard duty, but then I found two specific categories there were some men who were helping as we described earlier that their wives mothers or, or children evacuate mm -hmm. but then there's john raymond and john mm -hmm. raymond was an interesting person because john raymond has been described through many accounts as, as a simple person a lame person or a cripple mm -hmm. but john bell of, of boston 1775 who who is an mm -hmm. amazing historian yes uh, released in one of his blog posts that John Raymond may have been actually just on uh, temporarily injured, that he suffered a temporary mm -hmm. injury um, and uh, was not able to field with Parker's company in Lexington that day. I took a little bit of a deep dive and it. it. It turns out that Raymond actually was a hired hand for the Monroe Tavern with William and Anna Monroe. He served as a tavern keeper. Mm -hmm as well as a hired laborer uh, for the uh, property. He chose to remain behind uh, when the uh, British column used Monroe Tavern as a field hospital. Hmm. So what you had is in the afternoon, about three o'clock in the afternoon, the retreating regulars from Concord met up with British reinforcements under uh, Lord Hugh Earl Percy at Monroe Tavern, and that became headquarters slash hmm. field hospital. Right. And so Raymond remained behind and he was trying to basically protect the property. And there mm -hmm. are accounts that the British soldiers were a little bit out of control. First, they drained the tavern dry because of alcohol. Mm -hmm. I mean, they got any right. bottle of alcohol they could drink. Sure. Then they started stealing uh, all the mm -hmm. linens and all the, the high-end valuables that Anna could not take with her when she fled. Mm -hmm. Well, at some point, John may have protested as to what was going on. Yeah. Fortunately, what happened was is the British soldiers opened fire on him and killed him. Wow. So he was found dead. Uh, oh, after. my goodness. Wow. Uh, so he was a civilian casualty. And, and I have been able to account for a small number. That there's roughly, there's under five, but I've been able to identify uh, casualties uh, from Lexington, um, Monotomy, and Charlestown that were male civilian mm. combatant casualties. Mm. Uh, place. And John Raymond uh, was mm. one of the first. That's no, fascinating because we think about the the Minutemen, the militia there, but this actually is a war that encompasses everyone and yes. civilians and property. You know. And then a couple of days later, there's a scare in Ipswich. That yes, that 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 was um, that was one that Essex County found themselves completely unprepared for. Mm -hmm. uh, Ipswich is a coastal community, a beautiful town. I highly yeah, recommend it visiting. Um, where a naval cutter uh, oh. appeared off the coast. Um, a rumor started um, that the British had landed and they were marching through the Essex County countryside in revenge for Lexington and Concord mm. and massacring all the inhabitants. Well, wow. um, this is what it, it was. Unfortunately, it was, it was a terrible rumor that started mm. and it spread very quickly. And it mostly impacted uh, the Cape Ann region of mm -hmm. Massachusetts in more so the Merrimack Valley region. Mm. Um, the rumor reached as far as the Andovers. Uh, well, there was only one Andover right. that was mentioned yeah. in Andover and North Andover. Mm -hmm. uh, there were accounts of the British uh, landing in Plum Island off of Newburyport, uh, killing everybody. There's mm -hmm. accounts of them uh, massacring uh, people in Beverly. Mm -hmm. And people pretty much similar to you had a civilian evacuation two days earlier. Mm -hmm. They're doing the same thing. They're hiding wow. their valuables. They're burying their valuables. And you see, particularly in the Merrimack Valley, this massive emptying out of mm. towns. Mm. There's accounts of Amesbury, 
uh, Salisbury, mm -hmm. uh, Raleigh, completely empty. And what they did is they fled over the Merrimack River and fled north into New Hampshire. Mm -hmm. Exeter, which at the time was a colonial capital yeah. of, uh, of New Hampshire, was completely overwhelmed with refugees. Wow. At the same time, you have troops who are marching towards Boston from Maine and New Hampshire, and the ferries all along the Merrimack River getting overwhelmed because of this crisis. Right, yeah. There, there, it was such a panic. There's a humorous account that actually came out of Amesbury where a woman in her mad dash to get away from what she believed were the British Army coming that um, she gathered all her belongings, gathered up her child and swaddled and ran for approximately five miles. Uh, mm -hmm. and she finally had to rest and decided that she wanted to nurse her child, who was an infant. Mm -hmm. She unwraps the child and realized that she had actually grabbed the family cat and left wow. her behind. Yes, yes. Wow. And so with that that's the mindset of, of the day. Yeah. Well, Exeter um, basically said, listen, something has got to be going on here. Mm -hmm. because, yeah. you know, it, this panic lasted for over a day. Mm -hmm. They eventually sent alarm riders down towards Danvers uh, mm -hmm. and down into Newburyport and, and, and out towards Ipswich. And they eventually realized it was fake news. It was 18th century rumor. Wow. Yeah. And so they were able to bring everybody uh, back home. But it created cool. such a situation that two things happened as a result of it. Essex County and Massachusetts over the next several months actually developed an evacuation plan, similar to hmm. what you see after 9-11, really? uh, that if, because they realized that the Massachusetts coast, coast was exposed, that there oh, yeah. would be a British uh, mm -hmm. landing, um, and they could lay waste to particularly Essex County. Mm. They put into play a massive evacuation plan where they advised residents where to go. It was either head west towards Middlesex or Worcester County or head north towards Rockingham County in New Hampshire, mm. what to bring with them and how the militia should respond in the event of, of an invasion. It also triggered um, the fortification of Newburyport, uh, which mm. was the most wealthiest uh, ports of the time. Mm -hmm. Salem, Massachusetts, and Boston, before Boston was closed, uh, top two com it was yeah. top two competitor. Newburyport, as a result of the Ipswich fright, as well as an occasional naval ship sort of mm -hmm. occasionally scouting out the coast, turned their entire harbor into a high-end fortification, wow. uh, multiple rings of mm. forts mm. Uh, in it because they were so shaken up by the Ipswich. Oh, yeah. Um, so it was something that stood with them for a while, uh, and it, it, it eerily mirrored the evacuations of, of Lexington and Concord. Oh, yeah. And it's preparation for what might happen. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Uh, any news on the woman, the cat, and the baby? Were they all reunited? At some point? I am going to assume they were reunited. <laughs> um, I, I haven't found any prosecutions of the mother or anything. Right. Yeah. But yeah. For a bit. Yeah. I, I, I'm sure the child, when, she, when he or she was a teenager, definitely brought that up several times. <laughs> I'm sure that would be the memoir. The, yes. <laughs> my mother mistook me, mistook, took the cat and left yeah. me. So, yeah. So. We've been talking with Alex Kane, who is the keeper of the historical nerdery blog, as well as the author of We Stood Our Ground, Lexington in the First Year of the Revolution, and also I See Nothing But the Horrors of a Civil War, about this really extraordinary day at the beginning of the war and what's happening with this. So, Alex, thanks for joining us. It's been Thank you very much. Really interesting. My pleasure. And, and I want to thank Jonathan Lane, our producer, and I also want to thank our listeners. You know, Alex, when we started these podcasts, we thought we'd have you know our friends in and around Boston listening yeah. in, and I'm happy that they are, are all around the city and all around the areas around, um, including Lexington and Concord. But also, we have folks all over the world tuning in, and so if I want to thank our friends in Brockton, Bristol, and Brisbane uh, on three different continents as well as Chichester and Sussex and Manchester and Connecticut and Manchester and New Hampshire and Colchester and Connecticut and Westchester, Pennsylvania. Unfortunately, we're not going to play Chester now, but we will be piped out on the road to Boston. So thanks for joining us. Look forward to seeing you next time. Thanks, Alex.